Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Um, welcome to all of you in the program, and I also understand there are a few people visiting us uh, to find out more about the program. Welcome to all of you. This is an interactive seminar. I'll be, anytime you have questions and want to you know, ask me a question or make a comment, feel free to do so. Don't interrupt me in the middle of a set sentence. And then we'll have, we'll have some exercises built in. This is a shorter version of a longer seminar I've done before. Um, I've decided instead of focusing on longer short fictions, because technically speaking, when we talk about short prose forms, it can be anywhere from six words. I'll be giving you several examples of six word fictions and have you try to write one yourself to a couple thousand words. Uh, and uh, many, many stories that are a couple thousand words long, although they're called short prose forms or sudden fictions, are complete short stories with a central dramatic event, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And if time allows, I'll, I'll read you one of those. I have several three examples here, but I've decided to leave out the, long, the, the bits of my seminar about the longer prose forms, because that's kind of what we're doing in our workshops anyway, our fiction workshops. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in passing, but I'm going to focus on the much shorter prose forms. Um, sudden fiction, also known as short fiction, short shorts, uh, flash fiction, there are tons of names for it. You can go to one of those Robert Shepard, uh, uh, what's the other guy, James Thomas anthologies, and they're there's a lot of uh, introductory material and other, uh, 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 explications where they talk about the form. And they've got dozens of names that people have used for this sort of thing uh, over the years. It's very popular these days. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. I'll speculate that about, about that a little later. Uh, it can be much shorter than uh, 1,500 words. It can be as short as six, six words. What we'll do this afternoon is analyze and talk about several flash fictions from the perspective of the free tag pyramid, uh, in initial conflict, the complication, and a climax, in other words, a traditional short story form, the slice of life pattern, one thing happens after another, and the last thing is the most significant, the monologue, which is uh, a form that's very much uh, fits, fits uh, sudden short fiction forms very well, and the prose poem fiction. We'll also consider wh whether Techniques that are most often associated with poetry, particularly with poetic closure, might be applicable to short prose forms. So here's the first question I'll ask, and I'll read a couple of examples. Is this sudden fiction or is it a poem? Let me read you this prose poem by Russell Edson, one, a late great Russell Edson, one of our, our great prose poets. Um, and listen to it and tell me if it wasn't labeled, what would you call it? You haven't finished your ape, said mother to father, who had, mon who had monkey hair and blood on his whiskers. I've had enough monkey, cried father. You didn't eat the hands, and I went to all the trouble to make onion rings for its fingers, said mother. I'll just nibble on its forehead, and then I've had enough, said father. I stuffed its nose with garlic, just like you like it, said mother. Why don't you have the butcher cut these apes up? You lay the whole thing on the table every night, the same fractured skull, the same singed fur, like someone who died horribly. These aren't dinners, these are post-mortem dissections. Try a piece of its gum, dear. I've stuffed its mouth, mouth with bread, said mother. Ugh, it looks like a mouthful of vomit. How can I bite into its cheek with bread spilling out of its mouth, cried father. Break one of the ears off, they're so crispy, said mother. I wish to hell you'd put underpants on these apes, even a jockstrap, jock strap, screamed father. <laughs> father, how dare you insinuate that I see this ape as anything more than simple meat, screamed mother. Well, what's with this ribbon tied in a bow on its privates, <laughs> screamed father. Are you saying that I am in love with this vicious creature? That I would submit my female opening to this brute? that after we had made love on the kitchen floor, I would put him in the oven after breaking his head with a frying pan and then serve him to my husband, that my husband might eat the evidence of my infidelity? I'm just saying that I'm damn sick of ape every night, cried father. <laughs> Is that a story or a poem? Edson labeled it a, pro, a prose poem, but he wrote at a time when sudden fiction was not fashionable and wasn't even spoken about. In a different generation, perhaps he would have called uh, his collection uh, Sudden Fictions. Here's another one. 
Here's a dramatic monologue which is labeled in the, in the anthology in which it appears as a fiction. Let's see whether you think that label is right or whether it could also be called a poem. This is by Joyce Carol Oates. I just want to touch you a little. That delicate blue vein at your temple, the soft down of your neck, I just want to caress you a little. I just want to kiss you a little, your lip, your throat, your breasts. I just want to embrace you a little. I just want to comfort you a little. I just want to hold you tight, like this. I just want to measure your skeleton with my arms. These are strong, healthy arms, aren't they? I just want to poke my tongue in your ear. Don't giggle, don't squirm. This is serious. This is the real thing. I just want to suck a little. I just want to press into you a little. I just want to penetrate you a little. I just want to ejaculate into, a, a, into you a little. It won't hurt if you don't scream, but you'll be hurt if you keep straining away like that, if you exaggerate. Thank you. I just want to squeeze you a little. I just want to feel my weight against your bones a little. I just want to bite a little. I just want a taste of it, your saliva, your blood. Just a taste, a little. You've got plenty to spare. You're being selfish. You're being ridiculous. You're being cruel. You're being unfair. You're hysterical. You're hyperventilating. You're provoking me. You're laughing at me. You want to humiliate me. You want to make a fool of me. You want to gut me like a chicken. You want to castrate me. You want to make me fight for my life. Is that it? You want to make me fight for my life. Is that it? Sudden fiction or prose poem? The labels don't really matter, do they? We're talking about short prose forms today, but you could just as well submit such a piece as a prose poem. And Russell Edson, certainly, with the dialogue and the setting and everything, the mother and the father and the ape and so forth, could just as easily have called that a short story. Here's some additional examples. Um, as for the two above, the first, the first, the one by uh, Russell Edson was called a poem. The second, the dramatic monologue, is in Telling Stories, edited by Joyce Carol Oates, an anthology uh, described on its back cover as an anthology for fiction writing courses. That anthology also includes, among others, the following miniature narrative by Franz Kafka. This is a very short one. These are the seductive voices of the night. The sirens, too, sang that way. It would be doing them an injustice to think that they wanted to seduce. They knew they had claws and sterile wombs, and they lamented this aloud. They could not help it if their laments sounded so beautiful. Translated by Clement Greenberg. And here's one uh, from Varieties of Disturbance, a collection of short fiction by Lydia Davis. It's titled, A Man from Her Past. I think mother, I think mother is flirting with a man from her past who is not father. I say to myself, mother ought not to have improper relations with this man Franz. Franz is a European. I say she should not see this man improperly while father is away. But I am confusing an old reality with a new reality. Father will not be returning home. He will be staying on at Vernon Hall. As for mother, she is 94 years old. How can there be improper relations with a woman of 94? Yet my confusion must be this. Though her body is old, her capacity for betrayal is still young and fresh. Even the uh, cadence could be poetic had Lydia Davis decided to lineate this poem or call it a prose poem. Okay. First exercise, take out a blank piece of paper. Write a minimum of 50 and a maximum of 100 words. Dramatic monologue that includes action and conflict or implied conflict. No less than 50, no more than 100 words. Less than a page. Dramatic monologue. If you're finished, how many have finished? You haven't had enough time yet? Let's take one more minute and then, then I'll ask for two or three volunteers.
As you might guess, mood and tone are also very important to short prose forms. They're very important to all fiction, but especially to shorter forms. Anybody care to read what you've written? Give us an example. Bill told me I need to walk closer to whoever reads so that it will pick, pick up on the mic. Okay. It's really short. Of course it would be nice to have a dog. And if our lives were different, I would want one. Well, that's not they are moving now. Goldie needs a home today, but our house is empty, which is exactly why we cannot do it. There is nobody here but who made a walker. There's nobody here but me most of the day. And all the more reason. All the more reason. Oh, I like that repetition at the end. Thank you. Anybody else? He made me a rabbit for dinner on his farm. He told me that peyote caused a shamanic episode that required he consume mushrooms for two weeks to recreate the reality. I wanted more of it, he said. But why? For what purpose? You don't need peyote or mushrooms, I said. All alternative realities have a purpose, I pleaded. No, no purpose, as he cut the rabbit like a European. If there is no purpose to reality, then why recreate it? I love the wine. How's the rabbit? Oh, I like that. Did you want to read one? Sure. Okay. He stood on the street corner with her on his arm. They were secret lovers daring to be public. As they stood at the light and waited to cross, the red BMW drove slowly into the intersection. It was him with her. And her husband of 10 years, the father of her children, glanced over from his car. She slid further into her lover's being, hiding from what would become a media spectacle. Ooh, good stuff. Wow. We should make an anthology at the end of class. <clears throat> Anybody else? One more? Okay. Um, you're insipid, spoiled, and covered in jelly. Sticky peanut butter fingers, <laughs> <clears throat> pull and pinch. My perfectly pointed nose, sculpted by hands that cost more than your baby gear. Your loaded diapers leaking, and your babble is bubbled by spit. Uh, your binky is too damn bright. I should have had you scraped and sucked when I had the chance. Oh, good. <laughs> and that sort of goes with your ooh, because you've been work, trying to work from the point of view of, of children at times, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. These are great. I'd be ha happy to hear some more, but I want to make sure that I, I cover the rest of this as well. Um, the next point I want to make is that Southern, the Southern fiction short prose forms can be craft-based, just like any other prose form of whatever length. Um, they don't have to be conventional narratives, but some, some are so crafted. John Both in his essay, Incremental Perturbation, I like that phrase, How to Know Whether You've Got a Plot or Not, an essay he wrote for the anthology Creating Fiction, oh, an anthology wrote, well worth your time, by the way, says this, in my shop, by which he means his writing workshop, dramaturgy means the management of plot and action, the architecture of story as distinct from such other fictive goodies as language, character, and theme. Be it understood at the outset that mere architectural completeness, mere storyhood, doth not an excellent fiction make. Every competent hack hacks out complete stories. Structural sufficiency is Hackwood's first requirement. On the other hand, about a third of Franz Kafka's splendid fictions, for example, and a somewhat smaller fraction of Donald Bottomay's happen to be mere extended metaphors rather than stories. Metaphors elaborate it to a certain point, and then, like lyric poems, closed. And they are no less artistically admirable for that. As Charles Baxter pointed out in a lecture that he gave out in Minnesota a few years ago, it's not the size of the consequence that matters, it's the frame or the pressure of the event in the story. While some stories, as Janet Burroway points out in her by now well-known anthology uh, writing text, uh, writing fiction, depend on a structure of conflict, crisis, and resolution. In other words, the free tag pyramid, which isn't really a pyramid, but you know what I mean. Others depend on patterns of power, 
shifting the power back and forth from one antagonist to the other, which is a good pattern, a good structural pattern for shorter fictions, or on connection and disconnection, wherein characters make and break emotional bonds of trust, love, understanding, or compassion with one another. Take that Joyce Carol Oates monologue I read a few minutes ago and think how it sounds so tender for five or ten seconds. And then the tone and the intent changes drastically. Um, that also summarizes that connection and disconnection, the Lydia Davis story uh, that I just, just read, does, uh, doesn't it? Um, further, Burroway writes that, quote, a short story can waste no words. It usually features the perspective of one or a very few characters. It may recount only one central action and one major change in the life of the central character or characters. It can afford no digression that does not directly affect the action. A short story strives to create what Edgar Allan Poe called the single effect, a single emotional impact that imparts a flash of understanding, though both impact and understanding may be complex. The virtue of a short story is its density, for it raises a single what-if question. That definition of craft can certainly fit the story of conventional length. Do all of you know the story by Ray Raymond Carver, Popular Mechanics? How many of you have not heard Popular Mechanics? Then I'll read it. <laughs> it's short enough to read. Notice I pointed out that often putting a character in relation to an object makes the story work. Here's the story Popular Mechanics. It's about a one page here, maybe two pages if it were printed. <coughs> Early that day the weather turned and the snow was melting into dirty water. Streaks of it ran down from the little shoulder high window that faced the backyard. Cars slushed by on the street outside where it was getting dark, but it was getting dark on the inside too. He was in the bedroom pushing clothes into a suitcase when she came to the door. I'm glad you're leaving, she said. I'm glad you're leaving. Do you hear? He kept on putting his things into the suitcase. Son of a bitch, I'm so glad you're leaving. She began to cry. You can't even look me in the face, can you? Then she noticed the baby's picture on the bed and picked it up. He looked at her and she wiped her eyes and stared at him before turning and going back to the living room. Bring that back, he said. Just get your things and get out, she said. He did not answer. He fastened the suitcase, put on his coat, looked around the bedroom before turning off the light. Then he went out to the living room. She stood in the doorway of the little kitchen, holding the baby. Notice how the baby's picture is now the baby, and that's what makes this story work. I want the baby, he said. Are you crazy? No, but I want the baby. I'll get someone to come by for his things. You're not touching this baby, she said. The baby had begun to cry, and she uncovered the blanket from around his head. Oh, oh, she said, looking at the baby. He moved toward her. For God's sake, she said. She took a step back into the kitchen. I want the baby. Get out of here. He, she turned and tried to hold the baby in a corner behind the stove. But he came up, he reached across the stove and tightened his hands on the baby. Let go of him, she said. I mean, let go of him, he said, sorry. Get away, get away, she cried. The baby was red-faced and screaming. In the scuffle, they knocked down a flower pot that hung behind the stove. He crowded her into the wall then, trying to break her grip. He held on to the baby and pushed with all his weight. Prepositions, very important there. Let go of him, he said. Don't, she said. You're hurting the baby, she said. I'm not hurting the baby, he said. The kitchen window gave no light. In the near dark, he worked on her fisted fingers with one hand, and with the other, he gripped the screaming baby up under an arm near the shoulder. She felt her fingers being forced open. She felt the baby going from her. No, she screamed just as her hands came loose. She would have it, this baby. She grabbed the baby's other arm. She caught the baby around the wrist and leaned back. But he would not let go. He felt the baby slipping out of his hands and he pulled back very hard. How do you close that story? Here's how Carver closed it. In this manner, the issue was decided. Puts it right in your imagination, doesn't he? <clears throat> so that's a story that's complete, beginning, middle, and end. But it's limiting itself to character, object, and making that object do full duty. Minimum, minimum of setting, minimum of description, but it's all there in miniature. Um, 
to go to the other extreme, if um, a virtue of a short story is its density and it raises a single what if question, uh, what about telling an entire story in six words? There still has to be movement, even in six words. Fiction is all about movement, forward motion of some kind. Here are a couple of, exa of examples, and then I'm going to ask you to write one or two six-word fictions. The famous one, of course, is Ernest Hemingway's. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Typical Hemingway. Implication, implication, the iceberg theory. So much beneath the surface, right? Uh, there was an, an, an anthology of six-word fictions that were put together, and Margaret Atwood, the ironic Canadian, uh, contributed this one. Longed for him. Got him. Shit. <laughs> what kind of story would that be without that last word? That last word takes a conventional story and makes it into something very different. So here's the exercise. Write one or two or three six-word fictions. Include or imply action and character. Or write a six-word summary for an awk for a longer story that you would write if there were time. That also includes action and summary, but would be more craft-based. Stop having sex. Started masturbating tons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a quick, quick, quick story. Lawrence, did you have your hand up? No, I didn't. But Do you want to read it? Hard knock life. Hard knock life sings any Frank. Oh. Hmm. How about some more? Anybody else? Hollis? Thanks. Life and better fiction. Density, weight, compression, now lighten up. Huh. Hmm. Okay. And, and that's also interesting because it also suggests a kind of parody or imitation of an existing form, which is the ad that would appear somewhere looking for a connection. I'm sorry, right, right here? Under the influence, after the crumb, before the shame. Ooh. Huh. Good. That could be a bumper sticker. <laughs> John? Not guilty, but he was. <laughs> mm. Okay, a lot of implication there. Anybody else want to read? Back in the back. Teacher yearned to teach human beings. Okay. Dan, what shoe's going to read? Awesome over the side. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that seems to be a, have a double entendre in there. <laughs> Any more? Anybody? Siri, navigate home. No address found. Okay. Oh, very good. Huh. That was good. Very good. <coughs> Dead ant singing jazz for drugs. Oh, what were the first two words? Dead ant. Oh, okay. Singing jazz for drugs. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on now to... Um, a slightly different emphasis, but we're going to stay with the extremely short fictions, and we are going to move on to some haiku. Um, I'm working eventually towards suggesting that how to close out a short prose form has a lot in, in, in common with how we close out uh, lyric poems in general, and I'll give you some examples of that in a bit. But right now, let's, say, let's uh, talk about sudden fictions that are zen-based, haiku-based. Um, those uh, six-word six word, uh, fictions are like, are like haiku in a way. Um, according to Cordon, uh, Cor van den Heuvel in the Haiku Anthology from Simon & Schuster, the distinguishing features of haiku are not the number of syllables, as we often <coughs> pretend that we need 17 syllables, but one, concision, two, perception, and three, awareness. Suggestiveness is primary. Good haiku is subtle and might seem flat or empty to the uninitiated, but is very demanding of writer and reader. It's both very accessible and very inaccessible. 
as R.H. Blythe wrote, it is an open door which looks shut. The reader must share in the creative process by associating and picking up on the echoes implicit in the words. Uh, that, it seems to me, is a good definition of sudden fiction if it's 60, 50, or 100 words. The following haiku by Alexis Rotella could have been called a microfiction had she chosen to do so. Trying to forget him, stabbing the potatoes. Domestic conflict. The following fiction by Lydia Davis could have been called a haiku had she chosen to do so. It's, it's titled The Busy Road. I am so used to it by now that when the traffic falls silent, I think a storm is coming. Put that on my wall. While introducing you to the idea of fiction that works in part like haiku, I should also put on the table Robert Bly's description, the poet Robert Bly's description of quote unquote leaping poetry. It provides us with a way of thinking about what a microfiction writer sometimes has instead of craft. In, the book, uh, in his book, Le Leaping Poetry, Kevin Ward writes, Robert Bly explores the form of modern poetry, mostly that of Spanish language poets, such as Garcia Lorca, uh, Neruda, and Vallejo. His aim is to examine the movement of the poem, the manner in which the poet makes use of association as a tool. He writes, it is this movement, the movement towards an increase in speed and range of association that has given such fantastic energy and excitement to modern poetry in all European countries. What Bly refers to as leaping is a mean, means of traveling between two worlds, between the conscious and the unconscious, the known and the unknown. If you decide to explore sudden fiction, or are already exploring it, or decide to explore it in the aftermath of this seminar, and you read the various introductions and afterwards in the several anthologies uh, edited by Robert Chapaud and James Thomas, you'll notice that a number of practitioners compare such fiction to the experience, experience of telling a joke or hearing a Zen koan. <coughs> if a not, microfiction works, it's like falling off a cliff for the reader. Uh, and one technique that can make that happen, a technique common to the koan <coughs> and to Bly's leaping poetry, is to compare nature and human nature. We all, all, almost always see that in the haiku. Uh, here's one by Alan Pizzarella that does that. Driving out of the car wash, clouds move across the hood. Let me read that again. Driving out of the car wash, clouds move across the hood. Think a minute about that image. In closed space, clouds, the universe, the movement, a lot going on there. There's a leap, there's vertigo, there's a Zen moment. Do the same in fiction and you've done something significant as in this fiction by, again, Lydia Davis, one of my favorite sudden fiction writers. This one's called Insomnia. My body aches so. It must be this heavy bed pressing up against me. I felt that way my first night here on the bed in my, <laughs> my little room. <laughs> wow, this bed is really pressing up against me. I'll never, I'll never sleep. Okay, another exercise. And this can be 5, 10, 15 words, 6 words, 17 words, if you want the haiku, the old haiku way that we used to write. Write a micro or sudden fiction that includes a comparison or juxtaposition of nature and human nature. Or write a summary or treatment for a longer story that includes the same comparison as a central metaphor or as a structural principle between nature and human nature that's Zen-based. So again, write a micro or sudden fiction that includes a comparison or juxtaposition of nature and human nature. It can be six words, 17 words, 15, 20. Short, short, short though. Um, Katie? It ends up with Red velvet stretched out finely and resting with worms. Read it again. Expensive wood face, crushed red velvet, stretched out finely and resting with worms. Resting with worms? Ah. Okay, thank you. His umbrella was always half open. <coughs> oh, I like that. 
Ah, very suggestive. Yep. Um, as I lay down in ecstasy, my body murders each grass root. Murders what? Each grass root. Huh. Good, good. Right here. Um, I stepped into the river. The icy pebbles burned my souls. Huh. Okay, and next? Uh, spiders eat bugs in houses. Gross, but you did jokes at funerals. Hmm. <laughs> you got your hand up? Um, last autumn leaf dances to the ground. You'd rather I not mention it. <clears throat> mm, I like that last sentence. Anybody else? <clears throat> The way it was bathed in the sunlight, sitting there, plump in its grassy nest, it looks lovely on my table. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else? No? Nope. Oh, one more? Okay. Daddy rolled on mommy with his fist like lightning with a thunderbolt. Who? Oh. Explosive. Okay, I'm going to move on. We don't have sufficient time to do more than mention briefly the history of such fiction or the variety of forms, though there are lots, there are now lots of anthologies out there that, that talk about that, are the cultural reasons for the pervasiveness of such fiction at this historical moment. But I refer you again to those anthologies uh, if you're interested. Charles Baxter suggests that, quote, link is a feature of writing that is as artificial as an individual prose style. It is partly a matter of vision of where you think reality takes place. Lydia Davis mentions Kafka's paradoxes. Charles Johnson calls Edgar Allan Poe the unlikely father of sudden fiction. Not sure what Poe would make of that. <laughs> and refers us to Poe's essay, refers us to Poe's essay on the aim and technique of the short story, 1842. More than one writer mentions O. Henry, uh, who was famous for his reverse endings or trick endings. Um, H.E. Francis, for example, tells us that the form is hardly new and that its impact should be O. Henry without the cheating. Borges, Bartleby, and Brodigan, the three Bs, are more recent practitioners cited more than once by various uh, theorists and critics of the form. Um, the variety of forms are manifold. Uh, Jack Matthews compares them to platonic dialogues. They play out the implications of a certain idea or set of events. Very short fiction. Joyce Carol Oates writes, very short fiction are nearly always experimental, exquisitely calibrated, reminiscent of uh, Robert Frost's definition of a poem, a structure of words that consumes itself as it unfolds like ice melting on a stove. The form is sometimes mythical, sometimes merely anecdotal, but it ends with its final sentence, sometimes with its final word. Stephen Minot, more expansively, roots the form in at least five different traditions. Number one, true experiences. Sudden, abrupt, personal. Boom. Uh, number two, anecdotes, like O. Henry, classic, or like Richard Brodigan, contemporary, which are jokes when they surprise us into laughter, parables when they deliver lessons, and fables when they deal with animals and which are carefully crafted and structured. Three, speculations, like Borges, John Both, or Bottomey, where idea is everything, where character and plot become subservient to theme, and where there's often no narrative buildup. Four, dream stories, like Kafka with a dark, threatening mood, Joyce Carol Oates, her short dream accounts, that monologue I read earlier, or Richard Brodigan with a gentle, light tone, where mood is stressed more than theme and intensity, and vividness is all. And five, the poetic story, rich in auditory effects, alliteration, assonance, rhythms of syntax, repetitions, all the various things that we do consciously, self-consciously when we're writing poems, and more interested in imagery than in narrative structure. Um, an image can often be used to structure longer stories of course, as well as shorter stories, but especially in short fictions, images can be heightened, extended, repeated. I don't know who teaches the workshop next door, but on the flip chart, there's a nice little uh, epistle about the boss image. Somebody here teach that? Who teaches the boss house, boss image? And go look at that. It's, it's, it's very enlightening. And it also talks about objects. You can use images and objects as a way of structuring and working through your short fiction. 
Um, re as for reasons why the form is so pervasive these days, um, any guesses? Why would you say it's, it's so popular a form? Certainly, yeah. And you can actually read them on your phone instead of your Kindle or computer. Any other reasons? Some good, some not so good. Some is te technologically based. Some, attention yep, that's one a lot of these theor theorists mentioned, that we no longer have the attention spans we once had. What was I talking about? <laughs> So that would... They would like not want to write as much. Oh, okay. Brevity and concision. Yeah, just got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Very modern, very postmodern. Um, all of these things, anybody else? All these things, yeah. Um, short attention spans, editorial considerations. We don't, some writers, some books, some uh, uh, journals don't have as much space or online editors figure you don't want to read as much. The pace of contemporary life, new technologies. Um, Baxter is the most metaphorical, and thus for me the most persuasive. Charles Baxter, it is this: is it as it, excuse me? It is as if a shift has occurred in these stories, away from the imperial character of the 19th century, toward ritual, spontaneity, humor, and forgiveness, all characteristics of reduced geographies. What if very short stories are products of mass societies in which crowding? is an inescapable part of life. The novel is spatially like an estate. The very short story is like an efficiency on the 23rd floor. As it happens, more people these days like to live in efficiencies than on estates. So I don't know if you find that persuasive. It's elegant, certainly. It's very elegant. Um, as for technique and closure, there are a few things I want to get to, and I'll have you do a final exercise before we run out of time. Um, one way to write a short fiction is to write a traditional but short free tag pyramid story. Uh, popular Mechanics is a good example. One I have here that I've decided is a little too long to read given the, the fact that we have 40 minutes is, um, I'm going to leave out, but this, it's in one of those anthologies I mentioned. It's called Sunday in the Park by Bell Kaufman and it's a powerful story. But I do have one I can read here and I like to read this too because it also, it, it also emphasizes how you can find character through objects and would fit in very well with Hollis's boss image that, that she was talking about with, with her workshop students. Um, this is called The Beast Watered by Sam Michelle. Let me read this one to you, and I may, I may uh, annotate it a little bit while I read it. Notice how concision is so important here. Listen to the first six words and notice how much we're being shown without being told. First we have the title, The Beast Watered, which becomes clear by the end. This is one and a half pages typed, probably three pages on the, on the page. Dan, she said, yes, said Harry. Yes, <coughs> got it, know what's going on? What are, you, what are you doing, said the girl. Putting on my shoes, Harry said. God, said the girl, what time is it? Don't know, said Harry, two, maybe three. And this image, even the time, is going to become significant later because he repeats it to another woman, but he, somehow the clock has gone backwards, as you'll see. The girl raised herself up on her elbow. He saw her watching him as he buttoned his shirt. He saw her hair hanging down all on one side. God, she said, and blinked. And notice that one word, God, is used to express the experience the two of them have just shared. Uh, he got his shirt tucked in. He stood with his arms hanging at his sides, considering, then bent down to the girl and put his face next to hers. He lifted her hair up into his face. He rubbed her hair against his face. He breathed the girl's hair up into his face. Notice the use of repetition there. The girl made a sound. He felt the bed heat of the girl from underneath the covers. Got to go, he said. Okay, said the girl. Dan, she said. Yes, said Harry. You'll call me, she said. Sure, you bet, said Harry. First chance I get. Space break. He walked fast, crossing the tracks, crossing the bridge, trying to get things going. And notice the ING. Uh, this author, Sam Michel, is very good at repetition, at using not only uh, the repetition of imagery, but also the rem repetition of grammatical form uh, so that there are uh, undertones and subtexts and uh, echoes, not only to the text, but to the language. 
His breath came out in big clouds. His teeth chattered. He hunched his shoulders and kept walking. Along one full block of shop windows, he watched himself walk. At the end of the block, he turned, went past three doors, and then went into the bar. Hey, Harry, said the bartender, what's shaking? Plenty, said Harry. By now we know that Harry is a man of few words. He winked and rubbed his hands together. The bartender grinned and shook his head. Beer, said the bartender. Nope, said Harry, not tonight. I think I better have some of that whiskey you got. Coming up, said the bartender. And a pack of something, said Harry. I don't know, something menthol and matches. The bartender screwed up his eyes as he poured the Seagram's. You don't smoke, do you, he said. Not much, said Harry. The bartender came over with the cigarettes, and Harry took a $10 bill and a keynote ticket from his wallet. Now, notice how this keynote ticket's going to be used. Uh, it's going to be repeated three times, like in a fairy tale, or like in the boss image that Hollis mentions next door and says each time it's mentioned, it's got to be deeper and stronger and finally becomes symbolic. Um, on the back of the keynote ticket, there was a telephone number written. Whose number? Well, the next sentence, Harry studied the curves of the writing. So we now know whose number it is. He lit a cigarette. He saw himself in the bar mirror lighting the cigarette. He held the cigarette near his chest and the smoke curled around his shoulder and passed the side of his head. He tried a smile in the mirror, but did not like what he saw. He crumpled the keynote ticket in his palm. Then he held the cigarette down near his knees, watching the smoke split itself around his leg. He kept moving the cigarette to different parts of his body, first with his hand, then with that hand, to his lap, to his neck, his face. He did not let go of the keynote ticket. He watched himself. Hey, Harry, said the bartender, you're gonna smoke that thing or not? Harry looked at the bartender. He crushed out the cigarette in the ashtray. Guess not, he said. I don't, know about, I don't know about you, said the bartender. Harry filled his mouth with whiskey and puffed out his cheeks, rinsing. He moved his tongue over his teeth. Then he put his nose to his shoulders and to his arms. He pulled his shirt front up to his nose. He raised his knee to his nose. He checked once more in the mirror, then collected his change, left a tip, and kept the keynote ticket. So what just happened there? Everybody knows? Okay, space break. We're almost done with the story. He took his shoes off in the hall and turned the key to the door. The latch clicked. He held his breath, pushed through the door, then closed it quietly behind him. He had nearly made it to the bathroom. Harry, honey, that you? It's not the same girl, right, because she knows his name. He stood where he was. Yeah, he said. His voice sounded funny to him. It's me, he said. God, said the woman. What time is it? I don't know. Remember what he said originally? Two, maybe three. I don't know. Twelve, maybe one. He hated his voice. Not sure. He emptied his pockets, keeping the keynote ticket in his hand, and started taking off his clothes outside the bathroom. What have you been doing, said the woman. Oh, you know, at the bar. He moved outside the bedroom door. He could see her in there, propped on her elbow. Coming to bed, she said. No, he said. Not unless you want to sleep with a saloon. I think I'll get a shower. Pretty smoky in that place. Check these. He tossed his trousers at his shirt on the bed and turned to go in the bathroom. And then space break, the last final scene. In the bathroom, he took one look at him, one more look at himself, then squeezed the keno ticket into a tiny ball. He got on his knees and dug through the bag under the sink. He dug through tampons, through disposable razors, through hair, and through wads of Kleenex before sticking the keno ticket down at the bottom. He shaved twice. He turned on the shower and got the water very hot and waited in front of the mirror until the glass fogged. He stepped into the shower, bent his neck, and felt the water wash down over his head. He tried not to think, not about the smell or the keynote ticket or the cigarettes or the girl's hair. He let the water wash down over his head until he no longer needed to try not to think. Then he raised his head and let the water hit him in the chest. He got out of the shower, but he didn't get a towel. Instead, he dropped to his knees, pulled the bag from under the sink, and began going through the tampons, the hair, the Kleenex, the shit. He felt his heart beating, his ears filled with the sound of his heart beating. He dumped the bag on the floor and spread the stuff out, his eyes moving over everything, his fingers testing everything. He tried to remember the girl's face. He tried to remember her voice. He tried to remember anything she had said or what she had felt like when he had felt her. But there was only a funny smell. He kept pawing, P-A-W-I-N-G, on his knees. And that word pawing, of course, takes us back to the title, the beast watered. So it's going to be a cyclical process. And that's Harry's story. 
Um, so that's a traditional story, very powerful, very poetic, using imagery and objects to tie everything together. Um, the other story I mentioned, Sunday in the Park, has a kind of O'Henry twist at the end, but it doesn't cheat, and the, the twist is psychological. Um, another way to, to end a story, a short fiction, is to bring the work full circle. This is the first of four methods of closure mentioned by Maxine Kuhlman in her essay, Closing the Door, in which she says that in every poem, there should be, if not the slam of the door, then at least the click of the boat in the jam. She uses the poem Provide, Provide by Robert Frost as an example. Um, the same thing, of course, in, in uh, The Beast Watered, uh, that sudden fiction by Sam Michel, which is from his collection, by the way, Under the Light. Um, uh, the technique uh, works that way as well. Every word counts, and at the end, via the protagonist's action, pawing, we're back at the title, The Beast uh, Watered. Here's Provide, Provide, the Robert Frost poem. And watch how it, the last two words repeat the title and what, where we've gotten to by then. The witch that came, the withered hag, to wash the steps with pail and rag was once the beauty Apishag. The picture pride of Hollywood, too many fall from great and good for you to doubt the likelihood. Die early and avoid the fate, or if predestined to die late, make up your mind to die in state. Make the whole stock, make the whole stock exchange your own. If need be, occupy a throne, where nobody can call you crone. Some have relied on what they knew, others on simply being true. What worked for them might work for you. No memory of having starred atones for later disregard, or keeps the end from being hard. Better to go down dignified with bought-in friendship at your side than none at all. Provide, provide. Powerful repetition at the end. Uh, that makes that poem work. And you can use that same powerful repetition in a, in a prose, a prose, a short form, a short prose form. Another way to end, uh, end in an understatement that startles and arouses. Um, the Death of the Ball Turret Gunner by uh, Rondo, Randall Girel, a very short poem, uh, is an example. Um, here it is. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loosed from its stream of life, I woke to black flack and the nightmare fighters. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. Powerful poem, powerful last line. It's changed some people's line, some people's lives. My friend uh, Clint McCown, a novelist, short story writer, said that he was destined to uh, go to West Point and become a uh, uh, an officer, a military officer, and he read that poem and decided the military was not be for him. And he dropped out and became a hippie. All because of that poem. Probably some other things too, but that poem was uh, significant. Um, the third way to end a short fiction or, or a poem as well is to end with a prophetic or a apocalyptic statement. Um, by the way, the understatement that startles or arouses that story I read by Ray Carver, Popular Mechanics. In this manner, the issue was decided. Certainly ends in, a, in an understatement that startles us or arouses us because it leaves us imagining the baby being ripped in half, but without saying so, which would have undercut his effect. So if you want to end with a prophetic or ap apocalyptic statement, um, here's an example of that. This is uh, the famous great poem by William Butler Yeats, The Second Coming. <coughs> in which he's foreseeing the end of an historical cycle and lamenting the passing of a better world. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. A waste of desert sand, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blink and pitiless as the sun. 
is moving its slow thighs, while all, all about it wind shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So you can end with a prophetic or apocalyptic statement. And then the last suggestion that Maxine Kuhlman makes about closing the door in a poem, and it's equally um, useful for closing the door in a short fiction, is to end with an aggressive shift of balance so that the shift totally reverses the meaning of the poem. Um, I'll give you an example of that. This is the Edwin, Edwin Arlington Robinson poem, Richard Corey. Wherever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed and he was always human when he talked, but still he flooded pulses when he said good morning and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. So an aggressive shift of balance Boom, is what makes the poem memorable. If Richard Corey was just this admirable fellow that walked through town and everybody wanted to be associated with him in some way, that poem would no longer be read aloud in a seminar like this. It would be gone. So the ending does everything that matters. Um, the townspeople articulate their bitterness and envy of Corey. He's handsome, wealthy, confident, and then boom, he's gone. Uh, the Lethal, that dramatic monologue by Oates, I think does much of the same thing in the last line, it shifts. You want to make me fight for my life? Is that it? Uh, and suddenly we realize we're in the presence of a homicidal psychopath. It's a terrifying line. And it's also about as conclusive as it can be, isn't it? Such endings help to depersonalize a poem so that emotion can turn into aught. The poet needs to step outside, and the fiction writer as well, outside of the poem and close the door on it. Okay, final exercise. This is a little more, um, or you can, well, you can do it two ways. You can write a poem and then end it in one of those four ways we just talked about, or you can take something you've already written and try to find an alternative ending for it. The exercise is to write either a compressed slice of life or a dream fiction or fable in the spirit of Kafka or Borges that's suggestive and metaphorical, or to take something you've already written here today and end it with either A, an aggressive shift of balance, B, a prophetic or apocalyptic statement. C, an understatement that startles or arouses. D, a statement that brings the story full circle. So you might try revising something you've already written or you can try something new with this last exercise. The bones of my father and of his father, I keep my core tight and sway with the wind ignore the rain and make the sun burn my flesh so that one day my son can stand on my shoulders and be just a little bit taller. Ooh, wow, very good, very rhythmical. I love the cadence there. Um, you tell me every day to sweep out the gallery. How do you know I haven't? You finish your lips with polish and tuck the flyaway threads of tear behind your ears with expensive shellac. You slip your feet into painful, pointed heels and clack down the hallway to the kitchen. How do you know the gallery isn't polished, too? That the Louis XIV chair isn't on its own platform, the gill glinting under new balls, and not teetering in a corner, chipped and scraped, and hanging onto a 50s linoleum kitchen table with one claw. Say it again. I dare you. Oh, rhythmical cadence, powerful. More over here. I am in love with you. The way your hair gleams under the light, the rise of your breast while you inhale, your gentle cries and dreams. What we have is forever. Your wide eyes hold mine till midnight under the stone roof by candlelight, sipping water from a cup in my hand. You'll learn to feel this way, the same, I swear it. 
and then I'll remove the chain from your ankle. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice ending. More? Get one there. My mind lands on the landmine that you were commanded to avoid, and I wonder if when asked where else you go, if you can go elsewhere, you remember the blue wallpaper and the waterproof crystal glasses my mom had given us. The finger that now rests on a trigger used to rest on the rim of the eighth glass whose shards had long been plucked out of my shoulder. Oh, good. You had your hand up? The difficult visiting daughter in law was in town for a family funeral. They invited her for dinner fresh tablecloths, kettles, flowers, made bread from scratch, good soup, best entree I know, and luscious dessert. You give me a hard time for making such a fuss, but I can say you ought to see it. If each bite taken, I feed my grandchild. Hmm. Nice. Feeding scratch to chickens like scattering greens. A private affair of heats unfolding, a rooster in the hen house, a killer of hens, a breeder, not a fox, not a fisher, my new lover I watch. Hmm. Okay. Any others? One more? Daddy rolling towards mommy with his fist, like lightning with a thunderbolt, stumbled, fell dead drunk on his face at a peak. Hmm. Good. Good. Okay. Um, some final quotes. Paul Theroux, the writer who mostly writes long books, novels, and travel books, writes of sudden fiction. It is prose fiction of a certain length, about four pages, I guess. It should not be mistaken for an anecdote. It is highly calculated. Its effects, its timing. In most cases, it contains a novel. Hemingway in Death of the, in the Afternoon states his famous iceberg theory. If a writer of prose knows enough about what he is writing about, he may omit things that will have a feeling of those things as strongly as though the writer had stated them. The dignity of movement of an iceberg is due to only one-eighth of it being above water. A good writer does not need to reveal every detail of a character or action. Um, and I think probably that's a good place to end. My conclusion is take chances, make mistakes, and learn in the process. And it's much easier to have that point of view if you're only writing a 50-word or 100-word story as opposed to a 300-word manuscript. If you write a 300-word manuscript and think, oh, hell, this didn't go the way I wanted, that's a little different than writing a 100-word story and saying, well, I can put this one in the back burner, in the trunk, as, as uh, was it Brianna said in, in workshop today, and uh, try another one. So take chances, make mistakes, learn in the process. That's why you're here, but it's also why we write. Thank you. <laughs>